Ich darf Sie sehr, sehr herzlich begrüßen. Mein Name ist Ulrich Wilmes, ich bin Hauptkurator am Haus der Kunst hier und ich bin ziemlich überwältigt, wenn ich diesen Saal vor mir sehe, kann mich lange nicht zurückerinnern, dass ich schon mal in so viele Gesichter geschaut habe bei einer Eröffnung. Vielen Dank für Ihr Kommen. Ich darf Sie ganz, ganz herzlich begrüßen, auch im Namen unseres Direktors Uquien Wesor und auch im Namen unseres kaufmännischen Geschäftsführers, Herrn Dr. Stefan Groß, der seit einigen Monaten unser Team verstärkt. Und mein ganz spezieller Gruß gilt natürlich Kiki Smith, die heute Abend hier ist und ein genauso herzlicher Gruß geht an Petra Giloy hirz unsere Gastkuratorin, die in enger Zusammenarbeit mit der Künstlerin die Ausstellung, die wir heute Abend eröffnen, ähm, kuratiert hat und eingerichtet hat. Und beide Damen werden Sie gleich ausführlich erleben. Zunächst nach mir spricht Petra giloy hirz und gibt eine ganz kurze Einführung in die Ausstellung. Danach haben Sie Gelegenheit, sich die Ausstellung anzugucken, um dann um Punkt 20 Uhr sich bitte wieder hier einzufinden, denn dann werden hier auf dem Podium Petra giloy hirz und Kiki Smith ein Künstlergespräch führen und das wird sicherlich ein sehr spannendes und interessantes Gespräch. Ich habe jetzt nur noch die Aufgabe, meine Dankadressen loszuwerden und das gilt natürlich in erster Linie unserem wunderbaren Team äh, aus allen Abteilungen, die Ausstellungsorganisation, die Konservatoren, die Restauratoren, ähm, die External Affairs Abteilung, die versucht jetzt diese Ausstellung, diese wunderbare Ausstellung äh, so bekannt zu machen, äh, wie sie es verdient und ich kann jetzt, ob der Kürze der Zeit nicht alle Kolleginnen und Kollegen namentlich nennen, aber bitte seid alle versichert, Ihr habt wunderbare Arbeit geleistet und ich bin euch ganz, ganz herzlich zu Dank verpflichtet. Ich danke natürlich auch allen Leihgebern, die sich so bereitwillig von ihren Arbeiten getrennt haben. Wir haben internationale Leihgaben und äh, das ist immer für uns ganz besonders, weil wir ja eine Kunsthalle sind und auf die Leihgeber angewiesen sind, eine besondere Freude, dass wir so gut und willig unterstützt werden. Ich danke auch den Unterstützern dieser Ausstellung, den Galerien von Kiki Smith, der Pace Gallery in New York, Susan Dunn, die Direktorin, ist heute Abend hier, ich habe sie noch nicht gesehen, aber sie ist hier, Lorcan O'Neill, Laura Chiari ist ebenfalls hier, Timothy Taylor Galerie und dann natürlich last but not least Barbara Groß, die Galerie, die vor 25 Jahren Kiki Smith nach München gebracht hat. Ich danke, das habe ich schon des Häuferen getan, natürlich unseren Unterstützern, dem Freistaat Bayern, den Freundenhaus der Kunst und der alexander tufsteck stiftung die uns äh, natürlich Jahr für Jahr großzügig fördern. Mein besonderer Dank gilt Petra giloy hirz mit der ich in den letzten Wochen sehr eng zusammengearbeitet habe und ich kann Ihnen sagen, es war eine sehr fruchtbare und gute Zusammenarbeit, eine freundschaftliche Zusammenarbeit und ich glaube auch das wird sich in der, oder spiegelt sich in der Ausstellung nieder. Last but not least danke ich Rachel Ostroff, Kiki Smith äh, Assistentin, die ebenfalls hier in den letzten Tagen uns sehr, sehr großartig unterstützt hat beim Aufbau, bei der Installation der Arbeiten. Last but not least, Kiki, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you here. And you see, these people, this is your audience, they are here for you tonight. And uh, 
Thanks a million for your friendship, for your uh, cooperation and for this wonderful work in this brilliant exhibition. Thank you so much. Ich möchte jetzt das Wort Petra Giloy Hirz geben und denken Sie daran, gleich alle raus, Ausstellung angucken und um 20 Uhr bitte wieder hier einfinden. Natürlich nur derjenige, diejenige, die auch wirklich will. Danke. Sehr geehrte Damen, sehr geehrte Herren, dear Kiki, let's say it again, it's such a pleasure and an honor to have you here. Thank you so much and I would all of you ask to help me. Let's welcome Kiki Smith. I want to say hello to Okwien Weso, director, Haus der Kunst, who is not here tonight, together with all of you. Ich wünsche Ihnen natürlich so schnell wie möglich dass Sie diese Ausstellung sehen und so werde ich nur kurz sprechen. Zudem freue ich mich, dass wir uns danach gleich wieder hier versammeln, um Kiki Smith zuzuhören. Die letzte Woche war wie ein Abenteuer, die Arbeiten mit Kiki hier zu installieren, nach ein paar Jahren der Vorbereitung, zusammen mit Rachel Ostro, ihrer Assistentin und der großen Unterstützung des Teams des Hauses der Kunst. Das Ergebnis werden Sie gleich sehen. Ich möchte nur einige Überlegungen als kleine Einführung in das Werk und in die Idee der Ausstellung Ihnen vortragen. Wie es zur Ausstellung kam, Okwien Weser hatte mich eingeladen, Ende 2013 schon ein Ausstellungskonzept zu Kiki Smith vorzulegen, in einem Gespräch ganz spontan, in dem ich ihm erzählt habe, wie sehr ich Kiki Smith Werk bewundere. Die Präsentation der Arbeit einer Künstlerin im Haus der Kunst war da noch die Ausnahme. Unter Okwien Wesos Leitung hat es inzwischen, wie Sie wissen, viele bedeutende Ausstellungen weiblicher Künstler gegeben. Sie erinnern die Ausstellung von Lorna Simpson über Ellen Gallagher, Louise Bourgeois, Hannah Darboven und vielen anderen. Es ist ein Glücksfall und zugleich folgerichtig, dass nun Kiki Smiths Werke ins Haus der Kunst einziehen. Delikate, kleine Objekte und große Inszenierung. Eine Augenweide zuallererst in ihrer Ästhetik, in ihrer Bildsprache und Materialität. Sie werden sehen, zwischen Reduktion und Prachtentfaltung schaffen sie schöne und eindringliche Räume. Kiki Smith gehört ohne Zweifel zu den herausragenden Künstlerinnen unserer Zeit. Über mehr als drei Dekaden hat sie ein großes Werk geschaffen. Verallgemeinend könnte man sagen, es befasst sich mit den individuellen, den politischen und sozialen, wie den philosophischen und spirituellen Aspekten der menschlichen Natur. Die Skulptur ist Kiki Smith bevorzugtes Medium und die Zeichnung. Auf beidem liegt der Schwerpunkt der Ausstellung. Darüber hinaus gibt es Fotografie, Video, Prints, Books and Things, so war die Ausstellung genannt im Museum of Modern Art. Die Fülle der Materialien, die sie einsetzt, ist frappierend. Ob Bronze, Gips, Glas, Keramik, Porzellan, Papier, Pigment, Aluminium, Haar, Bienenwachs, Gewebtes, die Reihe ließe sich fortsetzen. Kiki Smith Oeuvre ist einzigartig in ihrer Hingabe an das Drama des Körpers, es ist meist der weibliche Körper, und ihre Sicht auf die Welt, in ihren radikalen Bilderfindungen und der Magie des Materials. Am Anfang, in den 80er Jahren, konzentriert es sich auf das Subjekt, auf persönliche Erfahrungen. Leben und Kunst sind bei Kiki immer eng miteinander verbunden. Ihre Arbeiten setzen sich auseinander mit den Funktionsweisen des Körpers, mit Schwangerschaft, Geburt, Tod und Sterben, Verwundung und Heilung, mit Geschlecht, Identität, Erinnerung. In den frühen 90er Jahren dann weitet sich ihr Blickwinkel um die Wahrnehmung eines größeren Zusammenhangs. Kiki Smith thematisiert dann das Verhältnis des Menschen zum Tier, zur Natur, zur Umwelt, zum Kosmos. Die Ausstellung nun zeigt 
einen Ausschnitt aus der ganzen Vielfalt dieses Werkes bis in die jüngste Zeit. Die frühen Arbeiten sind unter dem Eindruck auch des brisanten Wechsels der politischen, sozialen und kulturellen Bedingungen entstanden, geprägt durch Aids, dem Diskurs zu Sexualität und Gender oder feministischem Aktivismus. Später schöpft Kiki Smith dann aus Geschichte, aus Mythen, Legenden und Märchen, aus religiösen Vorstellungen und Überlieferungen ferner Kulturen. Sie erzählt sie neu und öffnet einen oft verlorenen Zugang zu jenen verschollenen Orten. Procession also folgt nicht einer chronologischen Ordnung. Procession offenbart, wie sich alle Facetten in Kikis Werk zu einer Summa verbinden, zu einem erzählerischen Ganzen. Die Ausstellung präsentiert Figuren und Erzählungen in der Opulenz der Schaustücke wie in einem feierlichen Umzug, der auf die Macht der Bilder setzt, auf ihre charismatischen Eigenschaften. Alltägliches und Magie, Spirituelles und Profanes, Schönheit und Schrecken, alles erscheint miteinander untrennbar verbunden in diesem Universum der Kiki Smith. So ist dieses Werk prädestiniert, die erste aller Leidenschaften hervorzurufen, die Verwunderung. Verwunderung und Staunen. Und ich denke, nach dem Luxus des reinen Schauens, vielleicht auch der Emotion, kommen dann die Fragen, dann haben wir die Arbeit des Verstehens. Worum geht es? Ihr Werk ist so vielschichtig und so komplex, also zum Beispiel, was bedeutet weibliche Identität? Wem gehört die Kontrolle über den Körper? Wie ist das Humane zu denken in seinem Verhältnis zum anderen Wesen? Was bedeutet der Verlust des Habitats von Tieren und Pflanzen? Was heißt es überhaupt, hier zu sein? Diese existenziellen Fragen stellt dieses Werk. Das wäre übrigens ein Begriff von Kunst über das Vertraute, das andere Denken und den Reichtum des Potenziellen zu erschließen wie Versöhnung, Regeneration. Und ich denke, dass ein Reservoir vitaler Erfindungen hier angeboten ist von Kiki Smith, seien sie fantastisch, idealistisch, utopisch, irreal, provokativ, visionär. Über so vieles ließe sich natürlich sprechen noch, über die fünf Räume und den Prolog im Treppenhaus, über jede einzelne Arbeit, über die Lebensgeschichte der Künstlerin, die Positionierung ihres Werkes in der zeitgenössischen Kunst, über weibliche Ästhetik und Feminismus, über die Quellen der Überlieferungen, aus denen ihr Werk schöpft. Wir können versuchen, nachher im Gespräch einiges davon von Kiki selbst zu erfahren. Nur zum Titel Procession lassen Sie mich noch ergänzen. Kiki Smith Welten sind inspiriert, auch gerade vom mittelalterlichen Denken wo Fantasie und Realität, Bilder, Träume, Vorstellungen und historische Wirklichkeit oszillieren, wo also das Universum der mentalen Bilder den Menschen nähert und ihn zum Handeln veranlassen soll. Kiki Smith sagt, the Middle Ages, one of my favorite periods to look at. Die Ausstellung als Procession, als Prozession, da ließe sich der Bogen schlagen zu den eindrucksvollen spätmittelalterlichen Prozessionen, deren Choreografie im öffentlichen Raum zu den dramatischen Gesten jener Epoche gehörte. Eine theatralische Demonstration, die der Magie der Bildwerke, welche man mitführte, vertraute, also ihrem heilenden und apotropäischen Charakter. Just to me, what's interesting about different times, sagt Hickey Smith, is spectacle, pageantry, was meint Prunk, Pracht, things like ceremony, ritual, public display. Und was wichtig ist, dass über diese visuelle Opulenz hinaus, es geht um Bedeutung. The thing is, you are creating meaning, pageantry, Is about meaning. Ich wünsche, dass Sie glücklich und angeregt durch die Ausstellung wandern. Ich habe allerdings die große Befürchtung, und das macht mich sehr nervös, dass Sie die Ausstellung 
so viele, wie sie sind. Und es ist wunderbar, dass sie alle da sind. Und wir freuen uns darüber sehr, nicht so sehen können, wie man sie sehen sollte. Zudem auch, weil die Kunstwerke geradezu eingezäunt sind, um sie zu schützen äh, vor ihrer Nähe. Ich hoffe dennoch, dass die Ausstellung Ihnen einen Einblick heute Abend schon bietet. Bevor Sie gehen, darf ich auch, wie ähm, Herr Dr. Wilmes, meinen Dank anschließen. Ich schließe mich an an deinen Dank, Ulrich, an Leihgeber, Musee, private Sammler und an die Galerien. Ich möchte auch sehr gerne Susan Dunn erwähnen, President of Pace Gallery New York und Barbara Groß, die hier schon seit den 90er Jahren die Arbeit von Kiki Smith präsentiert. Ulrich Wilmes, herzlichen Dank für eine sehr schöne Zusammenarbeit und auch seinem ehemaligen Assistenten Daniel Miles. Das ähm, Engagement des Hauses der Kunst und seines Teams werde ich jetzt nicht weiter ausfüllen. Ich möchte mich nur herzlich dafür bedanken, Oquien Veso und allen vom Haus der Kunst, dass sie meine Arbeit an diesem Haus willkommen geheißen haben. Aber bevor Sie gehen, es gibt noch ein wunderbares Buch, ein schönes Buch, wie ich finde, es liegt uns erst gestern vor und das möchte ich doch kurz äh, Ihnen ans Herz legen. Es hat ähm, Exzellente Beiträge von Julian Brian Wilson, von Virginia Ragan und Ulrich Wilmes. Lea Steppken aus New York, danken wir die schöne Gestaltung. Erschienen ist es im Prestel Verlag. Herzlicher Dank geht an Katharina Haderer, Konstanze Holler und Zilli Klotz. Und ich möchte auch noch einmal sagen, dass die Familie die Kiki um sich versammelt hat, ihre Assistentinnen ganz große Hilfe geleistet haben. Ich da sehr herzlich danken möchte und erwähnen möchte, repräsentativ für alle, Rachel Ostro. Dear Kiki, how many times I have been guest in your beautiful home in New York, working together with you on the exhibition and on the book. I want to thank you for all your time, for your patience, your trust, your generosity and friendship. And on behalf of all of you, for your spirit and your energy to bring your work to Haus der Kunst. Thank you so much. Good evening. My name is Petra Gilo Hertz, invited as a guest curator by Haus der Kunst. I'm the curator of the exhibition Kiki Smith Procession. I am proud and happy to welcome Kiki Smith tonight, what you have done already with an incredible applause. This just shows how beloved you are here in general and especially in Munich. <laughs> so welcome Kiki. On behalf of Okrien Weso, director of Haus der Kunst, and all of us, I would like to thank you again for being here. We did this a lot of times, but this is how impressed and happy and grateful we are to you that you are here. And I think it's a wonderful, great opportunity to listen to Kiki Smith tonight. So I will not communicate a lot. I think you find every information, whatever you don't know yet, in our catalog. So I just will select a few topics to encourage a discussion of her work. The rest is yours. No, you have to ask me questions. <laughs> I don't have anything to say. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly what I, what I want to do. Perhaps one sentence in general um, for the ones who have not been here yet for the little introduction. Kiki Smith is an artist of profound significance which is not only expressed through the fact that she has exhibited widely over three decades and that her work is represented in the most prestigious collections. I think it's the response to her work, and this is very visible to now, today, very visible now at Haus der Kunst, um, and it's just overwhelming. So we start with a few questions. Kiki, I have the impression that the visitors enjoy deeply to marvel at your manifestations of the physical and the imaginary and getting lost in your inventions. Do you think that this is owed to the fact that your life and your art belong together so much that your life is expressed in your art? Is Sorry. this a funny question? <laughs> My assistant's laughing her head off at me. Um, um, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea what. I don't. I guess I don't even think. I don't. I guess 
Um, sorry, because when you were clapping, then I thought, you'll get over it really soon. Because, um, but, um, you know, I like making things. And it, it calms my nerves a lot. And um, it gives you something to do all day long. And uh, it gives you opportunities to go look at other, to know other artists, which is the best thing on earth. And to go visit other artists' houses and to go to museums and go to art galleries and see things in supermarkets and um, you know, appreciate the world visually and learn the world visually. And um, for me, I was very terrible in school and um, you know, I couldn't read and I had a very hard time with comprehending what was going on and I was very anxious, but I learned to see. And to me, seeing has been a really great pleasure and seeing and learning how things are made and how things have been made in the past and that we have this like such and we have like a you know we're on like a murder planet but in the midst of the murder is uh, this unbelievable attention to uh, manifesting some of our capacity of being here in extraordinary ways and and you know, as artists, we get to be part of that uh, history, and and we get to um, like pay attention or revive or reincarnate the things from our ancestors, the uh, um, the attention to being on Earth that our ancestors have placed on things, and we get to reinvent that and. Um, see what happens, but that's not really an answer to your question. But I don't, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I don't ever know the answer. No, it, it, this was just to making you stop yeah. talking. That's all. But I always <laughs> think I can't stop. Once I start, I can't stop. Yeah. I w would be relieved when you just go mm -hmm. on talking, and I think you would appreciate this most. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this is a very wonderful point that you are not an academic in the way that you're more an intuitive and a visual person. That's what you always said about your, your art. Yeah, um, my father was the sculptor Tony Smith and um, he was very bright and very knowledgeable about many things and a very good artist. But one of the things that he really taught us and my mother also taught us was to trust our intuition. But I thought intuition is only uh, a kind of knowledge that lives inside of you that you get to access. You know, it's a kind of uh, external information that then you own the way like you learn a new word. You internalize it and make it part of yourself and and from that you can move very freely. And um, so it's so, you know, it's just trusting that you know you know, you have accumulated some knowledge about things. Um, but I'm not working from like, like I have no agenda in making art or like way, prescribed way I want it to be or what I think it's supposed to do. I think what it does do is um, create more space. Like it creates space where you know, cultures are often constricting space. Art says, no, no, no. Um, I have this capacity to, you know, think about this or experience this or believe this, and then, and then you have some proof of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so for me, like, art is always like kicking out the jams. It's always like kicking out so that there's more space in the world for people's real experience, mm -hmm. you know, and people's own, like, sense of <clears throat> the, mm -hmm. like, enormity of what humans can be, mm -hmm. but... Um, Do you think this, that this intuition, this sensuality, is something you could learn? I think about um, you telling how you have developed the idea to have access to the animal, mm -hmm. so this was, in fact, a dream. Once Kiki Smith had a dream that somebody told her, get the bird out. And this kind of secret birth you, you did in your sculpture, getting the bird out, this was in 1992. 
So you have the feeling that after this, when you really started then to um, dedicate your work to the animals as well, to nature, not only about uh, the body, that this is something um, you have been told and that these are things, intuitive things, who, who are not to be um, learned. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, for me, I think like, uh, I was trying to remember the name of a book today. It's something, 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 and the bicameral mind. And it's before this sort of, it's about this moment where we separate into ego consciousness as being separate entities and sort of previous. You know, so for me, like I'm walking around and like it, whatever it is, says, do this. You know, like, that's a good, and sometimes it just goes like, that's a good idea, like that would be a good idea to do that, but sometimes it's just like, and then uh, for a while I said, oh, God told me to do it, but that was just because sort of after the big Marxist movement in America, people like the idea that you would say, God, you could be like, you know, nailed, or you know, like to be, you know, like dismissed, so then I thought, oh, God told me to do this, it just, uh, to slightly be perverse and entertain myself. But at the same time, it is that. It's just like something becomes apparent to you. And sometimes it's apparent to you because you went and saw something really great and you think that is a great form. That form has something that um, I could learn from, I could have an experience of that would enrich my life. Other times it's, um, you know, just something you read in the newspaper and it holds your attention. It's just that things become apparent and, so, and, and to make something it has to be some confluence between like the physical world of matter and your, some like sort of nitwit intention that you have for five seconds and, and then you start having a relationship with that process. You know, like you think, oh, like I t went outside in front of my house last year, and the, it was early May, and the first flowers for the bees are dandelions, and then on every flower was a dandelion. And I took a picture, and then, you know, a month ago, I thought, oh, I better make a print of that. And then I thought, and then I made that, and I thought, oh, I better make a scarf of that. And I thought I could make a, you know, a, a rug of it and because each form sort of gives you an opportunity to have a different experience but it just it just tells you mm -hmm. like you know you just and you just follow your work and your work takes you you know to unexpected like you get to dead ends you get to places you don't want to be or you, you know but you just keep you know to me the more I get out of the way if I think I'm clever you know, if I think I have some really good idea that's going to get over, sort of, you know, it's immediately a complete disaster. So to me, I try to just, you know, follow what I'm given. Mm -hmm. basically. I mean, this sounds wonderful as a kind of liberation. When I think, and I would like to ask you what art making means to you when you have been a young woman, because you said this kind of attention you give to the body, to the organs, to the fluids of the body, something you see in the exhibition, in the first room especially. Uh, is this something that art for you has been a vehicle to, um, to work on your on problems of life? It's a good vehicle to become yourself or to see yourself, not maybe not to become yourself, but to see yourself over time or see how you change over time. I mean, I don't really think about what I'm doing, I just do it. And probably in retrospect, you can see that certain periods of time um, are very, for me, very much moving along with my personal life, but I don't, like I'm not interested in making work that is in any way autobiographical or anything, mm -hmm. but after the fact mm -hmm. I can see that my work and I are sort of marching together mm -hmm. a little bit, mm -hmm. but um, I don't know. Yeah, and your interest in the body is something which really has uh, shaped the first period or the first decade of your of your work of your create creative oeuvre could would you like to tell us something about um, this yeah it started first it started because i moved to new york and i was going to go to art school and i applied to go to art school but i was too shy and um 
I started living with, I wasn't that shy that I didn't start living with someone on the first day I went to New York. <laughs> but, and they said, and I asked them, they said, you know, if you just want to be an artist, be an artist. So I said, okay, I'm an artist. And, you know, because it's a self-determined uh, occupation, but, or um, devotion or something like that. But, um, and I wanted to draw fish, and I asked him, how do you draw fish? And he said, draw it from the inside out. So then I drew the spine, and then I drew the, you know, digestive system, and, you know, whatever other little organs I could see, or, you know, head and things like that. And then I put the skin on top of it. And then, um, and then like about five or six or seven years later, another boyfriend gave me a book of Gray's Anatomy, which was the, like a, the main teaching anatomy book in, in the 1800s, in America at least. And, um, you know, and I opened it up and there were like fat cells and nerve endings and I thought I'm fat and I'm nervous and I can make these paintings of being fat and nervous and I can look at that externally and then for me it was just like you know it's like if you became a landscape painter that is you know it's infinite what you can see in a landscape and it's infinite what you can look at in the body and each system that you look at or each part of it holds all of these different kinds of meanings. You know, you have your like, yeah, like nutty, personal, neurotic attachments to things, but then you have all these cultural ways that, you know, different entities are vying for control in bodies, and they were doing that very actively in the 1980s as they continue to do now. Um, you know, so it's just a way to like, you know, to put something outside yourself and look at it and see what it, Re what resonates, what it means, and not only in your own like personal nutty way, in ways that really impact your economics or your, you know, ability to get a job or to have housing or to, you know, or have health care or all these things, you know, surround any system that you look at. Yeah. So this widening of the perception toward, towards nature, this is something you observe in the exhibition as well. So starting from the body and the individual experience, widen the perception um, towards nature. What I think is you always have both sides. You have always life and death. And I would like to ask you, what would you tell us about this? Well, it's a, it's a central think, subject in the exhibition, yeah. many of these works. I mean, both things happened. Like, first I started making, you know, single cell organisms, and then I went into systems, and then I made things of the skin. And then once you get in the skin, you're sort of in figuration, and then you go into all these different versions of figuration. And, um, you know, for me, so that was sort of, there was sort of a progression like that, but not on, like not on purpose, but that's how it went. And then uh, dad, I started making artwork when I was 24, and when I was 26, my father died. So I had to, you know, try to understand why that was okay, <laughs> I guess. And, you know, and that life grows on death, and that, um, you know, that, uh, you know, the death is a, you know, more natural part of existence to be dead than it maybe is to be alive. And so, you know, so I just had to like think about those things because it was, you know, one after another, your family die and then you die. Um, maybe they continue dying after that. But, you know, so for me, it was just completely personal interest in it. And, and then also for me, it was really interesting things you know, like viruses and things that are things that can take on the attributes of death and the attributes of life, like they're frogs that can stop their hearts beating in winter time and then come back again alive in the spring. And, you know, there are all these things that, like, that we have these ideas of what is life and death, whereas, like, a hundred years ago, no, like, they had radically different ideas about where one begins and one ends. And, uh, you know, people made all these coffins with bells in them and sitting up coffins in case people wake up. And, um, 
you know, so we have this idea like that there are these lines and they're, you know, that's a very fluid subject. Mm -hmm. You know, other people believe people are floating around for months. So, um, you know. Yeah, um, I think it's obvious there are so many dead animals, especially birds in your work. So there are many memorials you do. So when you think especially about the crows upstairs, um, as well as the black animal drawing. Um, there's another work, Destructions of Birds. Are these works supposed to be read as a political manifesto? Hey, no, just, I had one, once I said to myself, I said, once I saw a bird, and then I had the idea that it could be in my lifetime that one didn't see a bird again, you know, because there's such, uh, encroachment of habitat, but it wasn't something I was thinking about. I just said once I saw a bird. And then um, this, then once I was coming home from Germany and when I got back, all these uh, dead, all these crows fell out of the sky in New Jersey. And um, right when I got, right when I got off the plane, but no, like the next day or something. And then, uh, you know, I thought I'm from New Jersey. I have to, take responsibility for these dead crows and um, that I made a memorial for them. But, you know, those are, and they couldn't say why, like they didn't say it's from pesticide or from this or that. And there are all over the world, all of these um, enormous sudden deaths of animals. And sometimes they can um, say what they're from and sometimes they, they're not so clear about what they're from. but. Um, you know, it was certainly something that was very striking and upsetting to mm -hmm. uh, have happened. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's moving or even shocking to see these dead birds of prawns lying on the floor there. And I want to ask if you believe in art to be a call to action, so that there is a moral appeal to change things. Is this an intention, obviously, is it? You know, not like, I, not, I'm not, like, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not just somebody just That's reacting to yeah. things in, um, you know, I'm just, mm -hmm. I just react, certain things I react to, other mm -hmm. things I don't pay any attention to or pay attention to them and they don't show up in my artwork. I mean, it's, it's different like being a citizen and a person and, you know, socially active or not socially active, whatever, and being an artist that, sometimes it seeps into your work, sometimes there's no evidence of that, like you could, you know, paint pleasant paintings all your whole life and be super active in something. And, you know, they might not intersect at all. Like there's no reason or way that particular things are supposed to. Yeah. They just, it comes and goes. I would like to come back to your work perhaps um, talking about material, I mean, any observer will perceive the abundance of materials and appreciate the range. Could you comment on your relationship to diverse mater materials? Um, yeah, I, I, um, I grew up like in a very, um, with a very spare, you know, in a very spare environment. And um, my sisters and I worked a great deal on my father's work, but we worked mostly with paper and paper mache. And, you know, so this shows up in my work. And, um, but we had very little things. And, and so maybe as something, I'm like completely crazy for decorative arts and fascinated by everything I can see in the world for the most part. Um, and, you know, so for me, in a, and for in a way, and not really being trained as an artist other than, you know, like me asking my father how to draw, and I went a little bit to art school for a little while, but, uh, you know, it's sort of learning on the job. I'm very attracted to materials, how materials are used, what the qualities are inherent in them and how that can be manipulated and what they, you know, how they mean historically and what they mean in different cultures and, you know, all of these things. And so you can, uh, you can do that while sticking your hands in them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you can learn, you know, some, I mean, some people like reading and I like reading 
Um, but I like getting my hands dirty, too, as a way of knowing things, like to know through doing. You know, I think it's just certain people are like that. I don't think it means anything. It just means certain people like to learn through the physical mm. movement of doing. But each material uh, gives you a great um, opportunity to have an experience, and, and which is different and unique to another material. I think this variety of material corresponds to the variety of sources you use for your work. You, you seem as a wanderer through epochs to times and spaces, so you are fascinated by the Middle Ages as well as by a Native American handicraft, as well as uh, you see the Art Deco, the Roaring Twenties, up to the hippie culture. So is this something, you are very inspired of all of this? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? It's all yeah. there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. no, but everything is there, like fashion and jewelry history. You know, like yeah. one could spend one's whole life studying jewelry you know, or anything, and, uh, you know, we live on a very rich planet, and we have rich histories. Uh, as you can see, if you go to the museum next door, which is a really great museum, you're full with the enormous rich history of this place here, and the beauty that people have made, and the, you know, like the depth of expression that people have made. So it's, you know, it's, it's all opportunity. Yeah. And certain things at different times sort of, you know, make your heart beat, but, um, you know, it all moves around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. To change the subject, perhaps come back to this word of the feminist art, the feministic part in your work. You always have been regarded as a feminist artist, and I just would like to recall the very beginning of, of your career, the debut, which was said it was a powerful debut at the kitchen in the 80s when you did the piece Life Wants to Live. <laughs> this is not That's mine. My <laughs> so um, perhaps you don't know this work and don't recall it. Kiki painted the headlines from the New York Post regarding domestic violence and abused women who killed their male aggressor in an act of self-defense. And you called this a life-affirming decision. Um, and I would like to know if you think that your work receives a new relevance in context of the debate today. So regarding also the recent women's marches in the US and all of this, so do you see there is a new kind of attention or interpretation or meaning of your early work, which always has this already um, oh. Yeah. oh, I have no idea. I mean, you know, the thing is, is that I'm a direct product of the women's movement that came before me. You know, people like Nancy Spiro and Mary Beth Edelson and, um, you know, many artists in America that were in AIR gallery and, and these sort of women's collectives that were very active and it enabled my generation to do work. I don't think anybody needs to think about me to think about what's happening in the world at the moment. The world is happening of its own evidence, you know. Um, I mean, I made work like that. It is, that was the first show I had was, uh, was with the help of David Vonarovich, American artists of us beating each other up and making soundtracks and making x-rays and, um, and then sort of showing, it had slides from um, microscopic slides of, you know, projected slides from, from internal body things and then also from Landsat photographs of the Earth. So it's like the macrocosm and the microcosm together. But, um, and I did think it certainly is life affirming that if, if one is in, it's better maybe like in a bad situation to like leave, but if that's the, if there's no other option, like certainly stopping someone from hurting you is a good thing. But I'm also a big believer in that one should take classes in, um, you know, 
not self-defense, but uh, first aid and things like that too. So, you know, that's another part of how to keep, you know, and they're just parts of how to keep in your body. I don't, yeah, the world, the world is evident. What is happening is coming because of its own evidence that, that necessitates it. Perhaps the question in context of the feministic, just to ask, is there such a thing as a female aesthetic? Would you agree to this or would you put there a question mark? What is this discussion about feministic art? Um, I have no idea. Um, I have no idea. I would say, though, that feminism is uh, a human rights issue. You know, so, like, people always say, oh, are you a feminist or this or that? It's like, it's a basic human rights issue. So, like other rights um, that we are to fight for, it's, it is, it's all the same. It's just a right for the respect of living, living and non-living beings and things, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so you say, like, of course, like, it would be stupid not to be. Yeah. So that would mean it's rather than describing a particular aesthetic than having a distinctive personal conviction and philosophy of life. It's just for people to have space to, you know, do where, mm. go wherever they want to mm. go in it. Mm. You know, I, I don't, you know, there's no one, one vision. There's no, it's not monotheism. You know, there's yeah. no more monotheism. Yeah. Yeah. You know, life is moving in all different directions. It's not necessary. Is there another topic you would like to talk to and I have no idea to ask you about it? <laughs> <laughs> Are you happy with the show here in Munich at Haus der Kunst? Very happy with the show. I really appreciate Petra. I really appreciate yes. the museum. I really appreciate all the people that worked in this museum <laughs> very hard with us the last couple of weeks to make everything really went out of their way to make it really nice. I really appreciate the kitchen for being so kind to us also. And uh, I'm really happy that my friends came to, so I get to see them for five seconds of my life. So that's it. Okay. Okay. Right, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.